listening to My Morning Cup, a podcast that features interesting conversations with genuine people. I'm your host, Mike Costa of Costa Media Advisors. My guest this week is Kelly Starnes, President and General Manager of Local 3, WRCB-TV. Kelly joined Local 3 in 2008 as a morning reporter, was soon promoted to weekend anchor, and became the investigative reporter and evening anchor in 2011. Kelly briefly left broadcasting in 2014. She was lured back with a management opportunity at Local 3, being named assistant news director. She was promoted again in 2016 to the position of news director. And now, Callie has been given responsibility for the entire station as president and general manager. Callie, welcome to My Morning Cup. Before we get on that rocket ship that is your broadcast career, let me ask, what's in your morning cup? Coffee. Strong coffee. Just coffee. No, I take a little bit of cream. Just a little bit, though. No sugar. Caffeinated or decaf? Oh, caffeinated. I think if you work in news, you have any history in news, it's <laughs> caffeinated. I've always been fascinated by the people who work in newsrooms who don't drink coffee. They're few and far between. They are. Well, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for coming. I uh, really want to talk about your career because you've had not only a great broadcast career, but an interesting path. And that's really what I want to focus on. But let's start with how you got started. Grew up in Atlanta and you moved to Athens. But something I found out about you that I found really interesting, you anchored on 9-11. I did. It was really kind of the moment I discovered broadcasting. I had a high school teacher who was the broadcast teacher really hard class to get into. I was a junior in high school and we did a rotation. So you'd be a producer for a few weeks, then you'd be an anchor and you got to learn all the spots. It just so happened that it was my week to anchor and that was the week of 9-11. So we had a closed circuit announcement. They would tape them and then they would air it in a certain block and everyone would you know sit in class and watch. And so it was that morning that I was anchoring and we were almost through our production for the morning when my teacher came in, stopped us and said, this is happening. And I need you to explain what's happening to the school. Here's some scripting. And then the principal wants everybody to stay in their classes. We're not going to change classes for the day. Keep your TVs on and let people know that that's okay to do. So you were recording the morning announcements and they came in and said, you're going to go live. It wasn't live. They did tape it, but we pivot. We had to kind of change what we were doing at 16. It's really hard to understand. I'd never been to New York. So these buildings were ones that I had seen on TV and in movies and in pictures, but really understanding the gravity of what was occurring and why it was such a big moment for our little high school in Northwest Georgia. That was a a little bit beyond what a 16-year-old can imagine, I think. Did it sink in for you? And I mean that in two ways. Did it sink in for the historic event that was happening? And the fact that, oh my gosh, I've been charged with explaining this to my peers. Not at that moment. It was after we recorded it that we went back and joined the rest of the class. And it was just maybe two or three minutes later that we watched the second building fall. And so in that moment, it became a bit more real because I could see what was happening. And I remember that day vividly sitting there and watching it with my classmates. You know, a lot of schools did not do that. They kept the TVs off, kids got home from school at the end of the day, and mom and dad explained to them what had occurred. I watched it real time. And for me, that was a day that um, I was just so struck by the people on TV that day, how they were so calm and they were able to describe to us what they were seeing and help me understand what I was seeing. And then the people as close as they could be, risking their lives to go in there and tell you what was happening. It was just really the first time that I had really considered all of those elements as a part of broadcasting and news and what that meant. Did you want to be a journalist before that and got into that aspect of it when you're high school because they offered that? Or was it just something, hey, I'll try this. I think it was just, hey, I'll try this. You know, my life was softball. And so the broadcasting class seemed like a fun thing to do, Mm -hmm. but I loved to write. That was really what I loved to do. So I think I better defined that as journalism as time went on. But even at that time, my love was not the idea of being on camera. It was really about writing Mm -hmm. and being a part of those big moments and getting the opportunity to witness something and explain it to somebody and be a part of that big moment. 
But that really is what kicked you into high gear and, and said, okay, journalism and specifically broadcast journalism. Correct. And really, I credit that teacher. His name is Mr. Riche. We're still good friends. He calls me or I call him every 9 11. Oh, Sometimes wow. I'll get care packages in the mail. I actually have it on a CD, a copy of my high school broadcast that day. And so we've stayed very closely connected throughout my career. He's got to be extremely proud of you. Well, he made a huge difference in a lot of lives. So you get through high school, you continue with the class, and you decide on college, and you decide on Barry College. Why Barry? Small liberal arts school. My high school campus was just 20 minutes from UGA campus, one of the best journalism schools you can find in the Southeast. It's Grady um, School of Journalism. Grady School of Journalism. And a lot of my classmates went there. I found out as I was looking at colleges that you didn't get into the actual broadcast guts until junior year. That was the point at which you could touch a camera. And I was already shooting news stories in high school. Yeah. So I really wanted to do it now. That's always been the best way that I learn is hands-on. And so for me, I wanted some place where I was going to be able to do that immediately. Barry offered a small journalism scholarship and gave me the opportunity to dive right into their student publications and broadcasting immediately. It was close to home, and my grandmother actually lived in Rome at the time, um, and so it gave me the opportunity to spend time with her and then also get to be a part of a very small class size that gave me the opportunity to do it immediately. Started internships immediately my freshman year. Anything that I could get my hands on, I would in terms of experience. Because high school gave you that practical experience. It did. And you know, one of the debates going on here is the value of trade schools mm -hmm. and the fact that we got away from allowing kids to put their hands on things that they might choose as a career. And I think broadcasting fits right into that. It does. I went to a vocational high school, so I saw a lot of people go on to continue their education with traditional means. And then I saw a lot of people go into trade like that. And so I agree. Broadcasting is that place where you have the ability to learn early on. You also have this ability to fall in love with it yeah. early on. It's in your blood. It, it does. So you started some internships at Barry. Where did you do internships? Anybody that would let me, mm -hmm. um, you know, I did some radio, I did some sports talk. Uh, that was very really? quickly ruled out. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough softball to talk about. Huh? Yeah. Uh, even in high school, I went back, there was a small TV station at that time in Athens. And so I did some job shadows, you know, just anybody who would let me come and hang out mm -hmm. and learn. But the big internship for me was at WSB in Atlanta. What a place to learn. Oh, the greats, right? I mean, yeah. growing up in Atlanta and to see these mammoths of these journalists on TV and then get to come face to face with them and get to learn from them. And they were so gracious. That program was so competitive. Sometimes they'd receive hundreds of applications for a semester and they only took eight interns. So the fact that I was able yeah. to get a spot was massive for me. But I think part of the reason I was able to get a spot is because I was coming from a small liberal arts college. You know, you had your Georgia State student, you had your UGA student, you had your larger colleges in Georgia represented. And so I think I got probably a, another look because I came from a small school. Yeah, and you're probably pretty talented, too. Well, I was a hard worker, yeah. that's for sure. And they kind of go hand in yeah. hand, don't they? So when you get out of Barrie, where do you go? Is it Macon, Georgia? It was. Yeah. I came really close to going to Panama City, then wound up in Macon. But, you know, I think I was the last generation of reporter applicants at Local 3 who were applying with VHS. And <laughs> I remember dubbing VHS tapes out of Barry's studio late into the night all the time. Probably sent out 60 or 70 of those VHS tapes, the labels. I mean, just the work that went into that, right? It was it's a process. It was a process. So didn't get a ton of callbacks, but Macon was one of those places I did. So went down and got the job offer before school was out. I graduated on a Saturday and started that next week. And what were you doing in Macon? Reporting is where I started. And then anything they'd let me do, I did. You know, if there was an anchor out, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> if you need me to write and produce while I'm anchoring, yeah, I'll do that. I think you have to be willing to never say, that's not my job, <laughs> right? I think sometimes the skill sets that I've learned along the way were not my job. They were things I learned from other people that got me the next job. And we're going to talk more in depth about where you are now. But if you look at what you're doing now, there's so many things you probably did along the way that weren't your job that not only give you a full perspective of the station, 
but it also contribute to helping you do your job better or understand it better. So Macon, then Chattanooga? I had a story in Macon. I'd been there about a year, and News Channel picked up. It was this quirky story about people operating a fake TV station in Macon. And it turned into this like investigative snowball. And it was a lot of fun actually to put together, but news channel picked it up. And so it aired in like 16 cities across the country. And I thought this was the greatest moment ever. And one of those cities was Chattanooga. So I had a producer friend I'd worked with in Macon. He came to Chattanooga to local three. And so the news director asked him, Hey, that's that she works at the station you were at. Yes. They made the connection. He said, have her give me a call. And so the producer called me and said, hey, we got a spot open. My news director was wondering if you're interested. And so that's how it happened. I actually had not applied in Chattanooga until then. And so I you know, came up and did a visit and I did get the job offer. However, years later, I found out that I was the second choice. <laughs> so I do have to thank that first reporter who said no, because yeah. the reason I'm in Chattanooga is because she said no. Well, I've made a great life out of being second, third and fourth choice. Just <laughs> yes. ask my wife. <laughs> Sometimes if you're second, I feel like you're more hungry. Well, and that's true. Yeah, that was me growing up, for sure. So you get to Chattanooga. How long did you think you would be here? Because, and I'm going to stereotype, you're a young journalist, and most young journalists are going to their second job in the number 89 market with an eye on the 50th market with an eye on, man, I got to get to Atlanta. That was my dream. My dream was to be home in Atlanta, working in the same place that the greats worked. And that was what I was focused on. There were several times that I came close to leaving Chattanooga for Mm -hmm. other opportunities. And that really was, you know, you asked about my time frame. I said two years, you know, you sign that two-year commitment. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it's moving up. See where it takes you. Yeah. And every time that time came, a counter offer occurred here. And the longer I was in Chattanooga, the more quality of life I found. And I think with more life experience, you start to value that a little bit more. And so the idea of working overnights and doing a 45-second crime package in Atlanta to get my feet under me there and work my way back up a totem pole, I discovered maybe Chattanooga is not so bad to think about long term. Yeah, it's funny how that works. I moved here in 2000 thinking the same thing. I'd be here two or three years. Here it is, 2023. <laughs> I'm still here. And it's a great place to be. You came in as a morning reporter. Talk about the morning shift and how difficult that is. It was so different than it is now. You know, I always hesitate to tell employees, well, back when I did, you know, because it is a different time. But my alarm would go off at two. I would, uh, you know, get ready, go into work. Back then, it was a skeleton crew in the morning. You know, nowadays, there's a lot more resources pumped into that morning newscast Um, Because, you know, they're on here longer. It's an important time of day. And if you start on a station in the morning, you're more likely to be on it in the afternoon. You set the tone. You're a part of people's routine um, every morning. And so when I started, you know, Jed Latrice, David Carnes. And so I was, you know, the baby reporter Mm -hmm. in town. And so it was it was a rough shift. But, you know, my first day on air was um, I got a call in to come in early. (laughs) earlier than two yeah so my phone goes off like shortly after midnight it's a frantic producer there's been a deputy in grundy county who's been shot and killed and there's this massive manhunt Mm. underway and i mean it's just it's a big news story so i got called in early went in the sat truck alongside a longtime photojournalist we went out to Grundy County, and it was a 16-hour marathon day of live shots. And about halfway through the morning show, the phone rings, and it's my news director, and he says, I think you're going to be all right. <laughs> <laughs> and truth be told, I mean, it took myself some convincing myself as well, because yeah. it was it was a lot all at once. But that was kind of a, a slingshot into the morning show, because it was a lot of breaking news. That had to give you confidence, too. It did, you know, that I could hang. And so from there, I worked on the morning team I don't know, maybe about a year or so, moved into a day slide slot. And for those who don't speak TV news, that's (laughs) kind of normal people hours. And then went the opposite way to a a weekend anchor position and ultimately then back to an evening anchor during the week. And that's where I stayed for the majority of my time. Yeah, I'm going to go back to a quick question on, on your live shot going into the situation in Grundy County. And I bring it up because it's been in the news recently of news crews going into dangerous situations. Talk a little bit about that as a young reporter, particularly a young female reporter, going into a situation where you may not feel real secure. 
There was a lot of that. I mean, I I think nowadays we talk about it, and I'm glad that we do. And there's a lot of things in terms of policies that we've implemented at Local 3 that have direct correlation to the fact that the general manager was once one of those reporters. But then we didn't talk about it. He kind of just sucked it up. My first job in Macon, you had a flip phone, but you lost signal not far out of town. And so if you didn't map quest before you went, you really were driving blind. You were by yourself, full-size gear, and you did pack the heels because you, <laughs> you had to look professional. But it was a grind, and sometimes you were out in the middle of nowhere all by yourself with no way to reach. So you were not only carrying your camera, you were carrying the tripod. You were setting up the camera on the tripod. And these weren't small, what we call wedding cameras. These were the big the big heavy boys. forty pound cameras. Yes. And then when you got back to the station, you'd ride it, you'd cut your story, and you'd rush to set to front it to be on air. So it was a lot. And I think that first job is so crucial because you do learn all those components of the job. When I came to Chattanooga, I was able to work with a photojournalist in those overnight hours because we were live and, mm-hmm. and back then technology was so different. It really wasn't that long ago, but there were no live shots driven by cell phone. You know, yeah. they were all hardwire satellite shots. So it is amazing how rapid technology has changed. Mm-hmm. So you cut your teeth on local news, but you took a little bit of pivot mm-hmm. and you got out of news in 2014 and you went into private industry. Why? And talk about the why, but we'll also talk about what you picked up from that. We talked about safety in the business, and sometimes that wasn't talked about as much as it is now. The other thing our industry hasn't done a good job about talking about over time is how hard it is to start a family and do both and really create spaces where that's possible. I'm lucky to work for a great company that does a really good job of that. We've learned a lot over time and I've learned a lot, but it felt impossible then. So the why really is I had my first kid, Yeah, you know, well, that's, and, a, that's a good why. Yeah. And the idea of missing bedtime, bath time, so I could go anchor the news and what that would look like for my family. It felt like too much, like it wasn't possible. So I took a time out and I didn't know what that meant at the time. It was really, I'm going to just step back, assess my skill set and determine where I go from here and what that looks like. And so I wound up at a local public relations firm as their relationship manager, which really meant that I was working directly with clients. It was a little bit of crisis communication planning. As somebody who had been on the front lines of a lot of crisis over time, I was able to be a resource in that way a lot of government relations, and then social media. I came up in the business at a time that social media was just coming about. And so I used that skill set as well. Well, and along the social media lines, I felt as a competitor, that was an area that WRCP excelled in. And I believe it was the trial in North Georgia. Tanya Craft. Tanya Craft. And I believe you were in the courtroom basically blow by blow. And as a competitor, I'm looking at this going, the hell are we doing? We, we got to get, we got to use this tool because it is a tool. It is. And I do have to give credit to my predecessor as news director because he set up my Twitter account and yeah. said, Hey, you want to try this? <laughs> you know, it, it wasn't um, widely accepted in our industry to begin with, but he was the one that kind of saw it as an opportunity and said, let's give it a go. So I was second chair on that trial. I was meant to be the sidebar reporter, which basically means you're telling people stories. You're not necessarily covering the court minutia. But what happened is we weren't allowed to take any cell phones into the building. And so there was no way to communicate. So I had my laptop. I was able to plug in, you know, with Wi-Fi. And so, so the judge didn't know that you could do this on a laptop. They I thought, don't think oh, anybody did. And we'll so, ban cell phones and they can't communicate. Exactly. But the crazy <laughs> part was, is the reason I did that was not because I was trying to get it out to viewers. I was trying to get it back to the newsroom yeah. so that they could write web stories. I would just tweet every three or four seconds. It was basically like taking notes on a notepad, but doing it on Twitter. And so it started to kind of pick up some steam there. I've got to give credit to your former uh, boss, Dural. Indirectly, he's the reason I'm on Twitter, because I think he and Joe Jacoby, because Joe was doing some Olympic stuff for your station, and Joe comes to me and says, you got to get on Twitter. And so Joe set up my Twitter account. And then uh, fortunately, Channel 9 got in the game with that. So let me get back to private industry. You're in it for a year. What were some of the takeaways for you that you said, okay, now I see a little bit of this and I can, whether good or bad, eventually you got back into broadcast journalism. 
That year was so big for me because it was a year where I learned that my skill set applied outside of TV news. I also got to see kind of on the flip side, you know, in terms of buying advertising from a local TV station and partnering in that way, what that relationship looks like from the outside. Mm -hmm. I loved most of all working with the nonprofits. Mm -hmm. And that's where I struggled, where I realized public relations may not be for me because You know, if there was a key group or a key issue that I really wanted to champion and be their kind of marketing and PR person, that was where I thrived. It was difficult to kind of spread yourself out among multiple accounts where you may not have that same connection. Were you ever faced with a situation as a journalist that the public relations challenge is, look, we don't want this message getting out. And that journalist side of you is going, wait a second, transparency is really better for us in this situation. Yes. And I'd speak up anytime I could. I was also grateful to have somebody that I was working for that really preached no comment is ever the best comment. And so that belief system allowed me to expand on that, to kind Mm -hmm. of say, let me tell you why, why Mm -hmm. that's important. So I think explaining the why to the client, that didn't always mean that they would agree or they would go the route that we were potentially coaching, but explaining the why and being a resource to the people in the room each time that came up felt like I was, I don't know, still doing good for journalism in some Mm -hmm. way. So you're in the private sector, but WRCB comes knocking and says, hey, we got an opportunity for you and it's not waking up at 2 a.m. Right. Yes. Those normal people hours. (laughs) The hours were definitely a perk, but what really got me was the opportunity to coach reporters, to take what I loved doing in terms of storytelling and helping less experienced reporters who are coming into town build those same sources, you know, learn how to network, how to write, to tell a story. So that role that I went into, it was a lot of roles all, you know, put into one because I was running a assignment desk, but I was also assistant news director where I was kind of bigger picture thinking and having access to, you know, stepping in when the news director was not there and really learning a lot more about the functions of newsroom management. And you were in that position for a year and moved into the big chair. Well, my road is very, uh, (laughs) it's not a traditional one. So I had a second child and went out on maternity leave. And just a few weeks after having the baby, I got a call. Our news director said, Hey, when you come back, I'm leaving. I hope you'll apply. So my maternity leave kind of turned into this rapid fire application process for news director. And then also once being named, then recruiting my team. And so it was a wild, uh, I don't even know how long that went on. It felt like forever, but I stepped into the news director position with a three-year-old and a newborn. You like challenges? Yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) So you're on maternity leave and you get promoted to news director. Yeah, he does that. That's a pretty good good method there. And now you're a news director for five years? Uh, Yes, five or six, (laughs) yes. Now, I do feel like, you know, from 2020 on, those should count for more than one year per. I feel like anybody working in a newsroom should get maybe double credit for those years served. Let's talk about that a little, because it definitely changed. Well, not everything, but you had to send people home. You had to do things in the studio that you never thought of you had to do before. Talk a little bit about that. I remember having meetings and preparing and, you know, preparing for what we don't even know and trying to prepare at the station level, not just the newsroom, but the whole organization of how are we going to stay on air and what is this going to look like? So it was that. And it was also this caring for people element Mm -hmm. that I think had me more worried than anything. You know, newsrooms are such cool places because they pull people from across the country with different life experience But a lot of times your journalists coming to town have never lived in Chattanooga. They don't have community here yet. They don't have family here yet. So they come in and they rely on that newsroom. They spend most of their time there. They do. And so to have a lot of people isolated. And also, let's not forget, I mean, you don't get to turn off the news when you work in the news, right? You're just in this constant state of absorbing information. And, you know, think back to those early days, how concerning it was for you and your family 
every journalist was going through that and also still having to show up to work and also trying to figure this out. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad I took pictures along the way. Um, A lot of it was just because it felt so weird. But looking back on those photos, it really gives me the opportunity to sit with those memories of what it felt like to literally bring a reporter in on a Saturday. We went through and we took every piece of gear we had. We laid it all out. We sanitized everything. We coupled it and grouped it with what would work best together based on somebody's, you know, set up at home. And then wagon by wagon, we would take it out to somebody's car. And I'll never forget what it felt like to help somebody load that up, but then say goodbye because we didn't know when we were going to see them again. Not to mention, you know, also trying to homeschool a kindergartner (laughs) and have a toddler and run a newsroom and you know, it was just the most wild time. And back to technology, to be able to produce a live local newscast with sending people home couldn't have been done five years before that. You were able to have, whether it was David Carnes or Paul Barris, in their house with a screen and doing their weather forecasts from there. Yeah. And with a small engineering staff, I mean, that meant me as news director in the booth back at the station, then trying to help an entire staff of people trying to do this for the first time. So it was just this constant problem solving. So now you're the president and general manager of the station. And teasingly said earlier in the introduction, your rocket ship career. And I'm not sure that everyone appreciates your path because generally in television, majority of general managers come out of sales. You took the journalism path. Talk about some of the challenges and talk about some of the pleasant surprises. Again, a pleasant surprise was my skill set. You know, I I think in terms of kind of the sales side of things of our business, it's also storytelling, right? It's also asking good questions and actively listening to someone to understand what they need. That's really the mark of somebody who can be a good partner and somebody who can market and sell advertising. Mm -hmm. And so I find that the relationship part of where I've come from applies in all these other areas, especially with a community standpoint. I said yes to this job because it's in Chattanooga and it's at Local 3 and these are my people. And so the jobs and the functions of what's happening at the TV station, yeah, those are pretty much the jobs you'd find at most TV stations, but the people doing those jobs I've known for 15 years. Same with the community. You go down to Rotary Club on a Thursday and you just see all kinds of people that you have met along this path in different ways. And so that I have been pleasantly surprised has transferred well. When you were young journalists, whether it was in Macon, whether it was when you started at Channel 3, did you ever imagine you'd be running the station? No. I do remember being at WSB and the assistant news director spent some time with me going over my resume. And he was somebody I would watch pretty regularly because I thought, I don't know what that job is really, but I like that job, that idea of how decisive he was and the fact that he knew what to do. And maybe even if he didn't know what to do, he seemed to, you know, be able to get everybody else to do what they needed to do. And he was quite a leader. So I don't know that I at any point in that process thought, oh, I want to be a news manager or I want to be a TV station manager. But that idea of bringing people together collectively around journalism appealed to me. It wasn't until later on that I thought, well, Maybe I could do that, but it was never the focus. And that might be part of the reason I am where I'm at, because the goal was so wrapped up in the work, in the people. It wasn't the position. I've talked to a couple of people about how they progress through their career. And it's, I don't want to say it's surprising, but it's pleasantly surprising the number who didn't have a master plan. Who said, you know what, I just focused on the job at hand and did it the best I could And these opportunities came to me rather than, okay, I'm going to do this for two years and then I'm going to go do this for two years and this. A couple more questions for you. Recently, uh, WRCB changed its branding and name to Local 3. Mm -hmm. Explain that a little bit. Well, you know, every so many years you do research to make sure that you are doing and you're in line with what the viewers expect from you. And so research has continually shown us that, hey, guys, there's this need for some modernizing the look. And so we started to look at the logo in general and just how we might modernize the look. That was really how it started. You went full in. (laughs) (laughs) We did, because as we started to talk about it more, it was like, well, we could just, you know, adjust the color. We could sharpen the image or we could go a different direction. And 
anybody who has come in contact with me in a job interview in the last so many years knows that I talk to them about we're a small broadcasting company. We're family run. That gives us the ability to be local decision makers on a local level for local viewers. And so I talk about that. That's part of who we are in terms of our company and our station. And so we recruit employees this way. Why are we not recruiting our viewers this way? Because these are the things that we're already doing. And these are the things that, well, research shows us that we're actually pretty good at. Yeah. There was also this third element. The general viewer does not understand where a network affiliation stops and where the local broadcaster begins. So there's been a lot of education required. I think media literacy is something that, gosh, we should be teaching in middle schools and high schools and even offering adults who may have not gotten that at that time period, because there's a lot people don't understand about what they're consuming and the sources of what they're consuming. It also became very apparent to us that we need to tell people that we are a local station. We're not owned by NBC. We are affiliated with NBC, which means you get to watch their primetime programming at night. You see the Today Show. But what happens in between is produced literally in this town by people who live here, by people who go to church where you go to church, people who have kids in school with your kids. These are members of your community. They're your neighbors. They're your neighbors. They care deeply about what happens to Chattanooga and the surrounding area. So those three things collide, and we start to work up the guts to say, okay, we're going to maybe go a different direction. And so what started as modernizing the logo and addressing some of these things became, okay, we're going all in. It was a massive undertaking, and we did it in six months, which is almost unheard of. It's pretty incredible. And I think the local branding is critical. To your point, we live in the community. We are part of the community. And broadcasting has changed. There's still that affiliate relationship. But at some point, the NBCs, CBSs, ABCs are going to figure out a way to, and they already have it figured out, to go direct to the consumer. And the strength of the local station is the local broadcast and the local news. And you and I can probably talk about broadcasting and television for the next six hours. Yeah, that might be a separate podcast. (laughs) One last question for you. What would you tell your 25-year-old self is really important for a happy life? Um, It's okay to do it the way you do it. It doesn't have to be the way everybody else does it. What do you mean by that? Well, my path doesn't look like a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I think two things are typically pointed out when I meet somebody new along the way. You're so young. (laughs) I hope they keep saying that forever. (laughs) Say that again. Say that again. (laughs) Um, And I'll say, wow, your path is so untraditional. I used to think that that might be a weakness. It's actually strength. Your story doesn't have to look like all the other stories. In fact, it's kind of cool when it doesn't. So I don't know what happens next because I haven't found anybody that's taken this path exactly this way. But I'll let you know. And I guess maybe another 20 years down the road, I hope they still tell me I'm young. Um, (laughs) You know, we can talk about what my 38-year-old self should have known, too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this has been a great conversation. I appreciate you coming in, visiting with me today. My pleasure. We, We will have another one. And I look forward to what's next for you. We'll see what happens next. Kelly, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to My Morning Cup, a podcast by Costa Media Advisors. If you liked this episode, please share it with a friend. I release a new episode each week, so be sure to subscribe on Spotify, Apple, Google, or wherever you listen to podcasts.